Hey, Pastor Carl here. Thank you so much for joining us online. We pray that you are refreshed and encouraged as we dive into God's Word together today. Good morning, Community Church. It is good to be here at New City. My name's Alan Cleveland. I saw a number of new faces out there uh, today, and it's so great to have you here. My, I am typically out at Community Church Riff Road, so it's such a privilege, those opportunities I have to be here with you at Community Church New City to hear what God is doing and to see what God is doing. We got a full house here, and that's always uh, exciting and energizing uh, to see and, and witness and be a part of. And it's great to be able to gather and share in God's Word and, and explore God's Word together. And so if you have a Bible with you or turn your smart device, we're going to be going to Ephesians chapter 2 uh, this morning as we continue on in the series that we've called, um, using a lot of you know, creative power, we're calling the series Ephesians, okay? So turn to Ephesians chapter 2, and um, we're going to be looking there at the last part of that chapter, but as you're turning there, whether you're going in your smart device or you're turning in your Bible, uh, your physical Bible, you know, I would ask that we would not look at this as uh, two-dimensional, that is, words on a page, uh, but that we would think of, of Paul painting a portrait, painting a picture, trying to capture the work that God is doing. Now, we all get wowed by something, right? If we're into the visual arts, we see a painting that speaks deeply to us. We notice the colors. We notice the brush strokes. We notice the contrasts and the depth of field or whatever that particular painting ha is there or photo for that matter. And, and, it, and it does something in our soul and it, and it stirs a, a reaction, a, a wow. Oh, maybe you're into engines, and you like tinkering with the car engine, and, and you open it up, and for many of us, we just look at it and say, oh, oh, I, I have no idea where to even start. Oh, you look at it, and you see past the, the grease, and you get past the oil smell, and you're just like, this is a work of art. And you think about how it was designed, and you think about maybe how you can improve its performance. Some of you are smiling, so you're like, yeah, that's my kind of language. Well, that's about as deep as I can go, all right, with that kind of stuff. For me, it's like this morning. I went out early this morning, and I like looking up. That's where I, I experience wows. And so this morning, clear morning, a crescent moon uh, to the southeast. And if you go out about 4.30, well, I won't put you out that early. Say you go out about 6 o'clock in the morning, right before the sun comes up. You look due south. There's this bright, shiny object. That's Jupiter, okay? That is five astronomical units away from us. Now, an astronomical unit is the distance from Earth to the sun. That's how they measure it. So Jupiter is five times the distance from us to the sun away from us, okay? If you hold up your fist and you kind of go like this and, and go to the left, now this again is you're facing south, you'll see another bright shiny object and that would be Saturn. That is 10 astronomical units away, 10 times the distance from us to the sun. Then, if you could hold up a couple fingers, now I know everybody's fists and fingers are different sizes, but to the left of Saturn, so to the southeast, a bit more, if we could see it with our eyes, is Pluto. That poor, used to be a planet, Pluto, <laughs> that they're trying to reinstitute it as a planet, but anyways, Pluto is 34 astronomical units away. It's like six times the distance of Jupiter. And, and, I'm, and I, I mean, truly, my mind just gets blown by all the, the, the distance that covers. But what it also does within my soul is go, wow, this is, this is awesome. It's incredible. And so as we come to Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is, is sharing his awe, his wow, at what he sees God doing in the ongoing work of creation that is uh, the church. Now, for those of you who may not have been here th uh, from the first week, we started Ephesians a few weeks ago, and 
Paul starts out by describing God's wholehearted pursuit of his people. That is, God the Father established the plan. God the Son executed the plan in his own execution. And God the Holy Spirit enacts the plan. In other words, he applies, takes that plan that Christ accomplished on the cross and applies it to God's people. And, and in the verses that follow after that, he expresses several prayers on behalf of the people in this church, this group of Christ followers, and it's a similar prayer that I pray. I mean, I pray for, for us as a body, and, and I know Pastor David prays, and the leadership here prays. We pray together that our, the Lord would open up our eyes and our hearts to not only know as a factual thing, but to know in our hearts and in our experience what God is doing on our behalf. And last week, Pastor David spoke about God's grace reaching out to us to where we're at uh, so that he ended on these verses, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of work so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. The gospel, the good news that Paul is sharing is that that rift that existed between God and his, and his creation, those who are created in his image, ha- has been has been healed, it's been breached, it's been, uh, we've been connected with God through Christ. But the good news is not only that the vertical relationship is repaired, it, it has significant impact and, and, and significant implications for our horizontal relationships. That is, our relationship with one another, no matter how imperfect we may be, God is working in us and through us. So we are citizens of the same kingdom, saints in service to this one Lord, and daughters and sons in God's family. Now, to fully appreciate this, Paul unpacks it a bit more, and and he does this by reminding the followers of Jesus in Ephesus where they came from. Now, this is not an effort on his part to rub their nose in it, but just to get them to go, wow, look at what God has done. And we can see it. Look at verse 11 of chapter 2 where we read this. Therefore, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, when we read this today, you know, we may get lost in, in some of what Paul just described here. Well, I'm, we'll look at it in just a moment here. But to these people at this church... On this occasion, they knew what he was talking about, and they felt it deeply. Um, Because people brought in their baggage each and every day uh, into their experience and into their worship experience with God, and, 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 and there was a tension that existed that we can't fully fathom or comprehend, but, but it, it's, he starts and he says, you Gentiles, you non-Jews, who were looked down upon and dismissed. Now, that word circumcision and uncircumcision, it refers to a a part of the covenant that God made with his people. And circumcision was part of the sign of the covenant. And so the term uncircumcision was a derogatory term used to describe people on the outside. As a matter of fact, in that day and age, in the city of Jerusalem, there was a temple that was built by Herod. It wasn't the original temple by Solomon. It was a poor replica of Solomon's temple, but Herod built it. And on the outside of it, he built a wall. And on the outside of these walls were plaques 
that basically said any Gentile, that is any non-Jew, that is anybody who was of the uncircumcision, if you cross this line, you would die. You would bring it upon yourself if you went past this wall, if you went past this barrier. They erected the, a barrier that sought to keep the Gentiles out, and Paul takes it a step further. He goes, you know, those who were of the circumcision, those who prided themselves on, on keeping the law and keeping the regulations, who, who sought to alienate you this way, didn't really capture the depth of all of it. As one writer put it, and we see it here, he was, they were Christless. In other words, these Gentiles had no idea of that God had promised a Messiah. They were stateless. They were outside of the covenant people of Israel. They were friendless. They were hopeless. And, and he says, and you were without God. Uh, this is where they were. Uh, in effect, they were on the wrong side of the, of the wall. And if we think about it, that's where we were before Jesus. We were on the wrong side of the wall. Now, when we start talking about things like sin and the reality of hell, if you have a question about the reality of hell, all you have to do is read the words of Jesus. He believes in it. And, and we can chafe a little bit and feel a little bit uncomfortable. And, and maybe... If you've ever had somebody look at you and say, hey, have you ever thought about your sin? You've said, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, come on now. Nobody's perfect, right? And I'm not that bad. Well, as soon as we declare that we're not that bad, what are we affirming? We're not that good. And when we affirm that we're not that good, we're affirming what the Bible says, that all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. You fall short of God's and his standards and what he's called us to do and be. Oh, now this is where, you know, I, I invite you, if you haven't read through this letter, read through it, and you'll see there are several dramatic turning points. Like in last week, the uh, uh, big turning point was verse 4 where he said, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. At verse 4, that but God, it signaled a dramatic turning point from where Paul had been to say, this is who you were, this is who you are now. We got a same kind of thing happening here. Look at verse 13 when Paul writes this, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, several weeks ago, I was visiting my parents in Pennsylvania, and my brother, who lives in Texas, he flew in, so it was kind of a, a gathering of the original band. The band got back together, and we were just, you know, sharing memories and things like that. We were going through old family photos and uh, learned some interesting things along the way. But I saw plenty of people that I was related to by blood, but were so different, uh, distant, they were so far away, that for all practical purposes, they're strangers. I mean, hey, you might be related to me, and I, like you're so far out there on the branch, or I'm so far out there on the branch, it's like, we, you know, we were strangers. They're far away in my thoughts and affections. Well, Paul said, you were distant, but now you've been brought close. And not as that second cousin that no one knows what to make sense of them. No, not at all. He goes on to say, he says, listen, this is the truth of it. Starting in verse 14, and I want to read down through verse 18, because we want to feel and hear the rhythm of Paul's, uh, what he's sharing for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby 
killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Now, there's a lot here. There's a lot to just settle in and just let it marinate in our hearts and our minds to, to see the depth of all that he is sharing. But, you know, if, if in the course of conversation, I repeated something to you several times, like say, hey, I love my wife Susan, and I kept repeating it, like on the fourth or fifth time, you might say, got it, thank you very much, uh, you know, I, I, I understand, all right, I got the message. Well, here there's a word that's been repeated multiple times. I don't know if you picked it up as we were going through it, but it was that word, peace. Peace. That Jesus came and brought us peace. Now, when you think about peace, and if somebody were to say, hey, what's peace? You know, it's very often people say, well, if you're not fighting, you're at peace. And, and peace is the absence of of conflict, but indeed, peace is more than just the absence of conflict, of strife. Again, going back to when my, bro my parents and my brother and I, we were sharing memories, and sometimes we got talking about some of the things we did as a family, some of the family trips we took, and, and I remember as a little guy being in the back seat with my brother. Now, this is in a car, you know, that fake leather kind of seat. We didn't have air conditioning. Well, no, we did. It was called the 460. You know what that is? Four windows down at 60 miles per hour, that kind of air conditioning. So, you know, on those hot days, you, kinda, you just want your space. And my brother, he would move over. So every once in a while, I had to gently remind him that I wanted my space. And here's this imaginary line right here. Don't you cross it. Now, you know, if you're a younger brother or a younger sister, it's your calling in life to, to cross that imaginary line, right? I mean, that from, a, from a firstborn's perspective, that's, that's the case. And, and so I just remember those times and, and my dad just getting all frustrated and, and, and going on and like saying, what are you doing back there? Uh, you know, stop it. Do you want me to pull this car over, the ultimate parental threat? I want peace and I want quiet. We well, got quiet. But was it really a state of peace? As I tried to make sure that my brother understood, yeah, just did you hear what he said? <laughs> Stay on your side. Yeah. When Paul speaks of peace, he's reflecting a theme that runs deep and goes back to a beautiful word, a Hebrew word called shalom. And, and you can go all the way back in Genesis and you can see where, where mankind first experienced the lack of shalom. It goes all the way back to the garden. when all of a sudden peace was lost. And if you trace it through all the way through Revelation, you see the depth and the fullness of the meaning of shalom, both in when it's missing and when it's present. It is more than a lack of conflict or tension, but it's a blessing. It's a, it's a, a, a desire for well-being, a, a wholeness to experience life as God has created us to experience it. With that, with that sense of awe and appreciation of what he's done. And, you know, you think back to when the disciples were with Jesus in those days, right after the triumphal entry, okay? You've got to imagine that the emotions were pretty ramped up. There was a lot of excitement because here the, the disciples had been with Jesus when they came into the crowd and uh, into the crowded Jerusalem streets and the cries were going up, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And, and just this sense of excitement around Jesus. But even though they were excited because they were on Team Jesus, Jesus himself had been saying some things. Very unsettling, right? 
if you've read through the gospel accounts, you, you know there were any number of times where Jesus said, well, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. He said it overtly. Sometimes he, it was by way of suggestion, but that was the underlying current of what he was saying. And so you got to imagine at some point the disciples look at him and, and they say, Jesus, what on earth are you talking about? Don't you see everything's going our way? Everything's going your way. This is incredible. The crowds love you. But Jesus looked at them and he said this in, in John 14, 27. He said, peace I leave with you. That is shalom I leave with you. My peace, I, I give to you, not as the world gives, but I give my peace to you. Now, some feel very comfortable leaving Jesus as a moral teacher, that is, somebody who is very ethical and a, and a great guy to be around, who said the right things at the right time to try to encourage people who are feeling a bit dismayed. But if you approach the claims of Jesus with intellectual honesty, he says so much more than just, in this case, wishing his disciples well. Uh, he came knowing that in just a few days he was going to be crucified. He knew in that moment when he spoke these words about peace that if anybody on the planet had a right to feel no peace, it was him. But he knew he was at the right place at the right time to do the right plan for the, according to God's plan. And, and, and he knew that in dying and rising on that third day, those who followed him would experience peace with God. Oh, Jesus knew that his death on the cross would purchase our peace and in dying on the cross, he killed the hostility between us and God and, and ultimately between one another, okay? That's what Paul is reflecting on here in verse 16. Look at this, when, <clears throat> or hear these words. When he says, it might reconcile us both to God in body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. That that Christ took care of that which was against us, the charge that was against us through his own death on the cross. And so as a result, Jesus is our peace. He tore down the wall between God and his people. And he tore down the wall, the walls between us, such that we pick it up in verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This has a before and after feel, doesn't it? You go back to verse 11, you start tracing it through. Before you were strangers. Now you're citizens of God's kingdom together. Uh, before you were aliens, you were foreigners. Now you are saints serving the one Lord together. Now you are God's children of his household, his family, as his daughters and his sons that he calls by name and he loves each one. Oh, every one of these descriptions is so worth just sitting back and thinking about. And this is when you read through the Bible, you hear once in a while, meditate on the God's Word as a theme. What it means is just read it, think about it. Read it, think about it. Meditate on it. Let it marinate in your heart, in your soul, to see what bubbles up in terms of what's speaking to you. 
I mean, what's speaking to you right at this moment? You know, which one of these descriptions? You're a citizen of God's kingdom. You're a saint in his service. You're a daughter or a son in his family. What one is plucking on the strings of your heart right now? You know, for me, the word saint is the one that that jumps out at me as I was thinking about this morning. And, you know, when you hear the word saint, it's kind of like we picture automatically jumps in our mind. Someone who's perfect, they have a halo, you know, they're kind of superhumans. Uh, last year, Susan and I were able to go on a trip in which we saw a lot of beautiful artwork, and a lot of it was religious-based art, and so they had all these pictures of all these saints. And as I was looking at them, well, what I saw depicted there just didn't quite seem human, all right? They, they never showed a, in what, any one of those paintings, like what would happen if, uh, you know, this saint's chariot was cut off in traffic or something like that, okay? You never saw pictures like that. They, they always seemed to be walking a few inches above the ground. Their feet never really got dirty, and they had this shiny thing around their head. But here's what these words are saying. This is what Paul is saying. That we are saints together. So I dare you now with a... Try to keep a straight face. Look at the person next to you and say, you are a saint in Jesus Christ. Go ahead, try it. Yeah, Yeah, some of you, okay. Hold the laughter down, some of you. All right, yeah, I hear some laughter. Okay, but please don't, you know, don't fall on the floor, whatever, but... You know, it's, why was it so hard to do? Because we have this image of perfection, and we're looking at this person and saying, you're perfect, knowing that they're not perfect, but knowing in reality, I'm not perfect. Paul here is not calling us saints or calling them saints because of how perfect we are, or they were back then, or that we have a holier-than-thou attitude, he calls them saints, he calls us saints, because God is the one who does the saving. He's the one who's torn down the walls so that through his people, we are his workmanship, created for good works, set apart to display the grace of God at work. We are the place of his dwelling. That when people look at us this morning, they might disagree with maybe positions we might articulate, and they might not understand the music or whatever, but it would be my hope that they would look and say, but something is going on there. There's a dynamic there. It's like God is actually working there. And that's what it means to be a saint, and and that's awesome. You know, we don't want to be a group of people like a piece of art just hanging on the wall. We, we want to do something with this news. But we have to acknowledge that one of the things we need to wrestle with is the fact that a unity of, of heart, that is um, being one, being those fellow citizens, being those saints as one, being in that one family. And we know how messy family can be, right? Family can get messy. And so the challenge is that unity of heart and spirit and direction and purpose and vision and mission is hard work. And what makes it difficult is that inside myself, my my own heart can be divided. There can be walls there. And throw other people into the mix, imperfect, frustrating, erratic, sin-hugging people. And it's easy to understand why walls can go up between people. The, the re- reasons can vary. I mean, it can be preferences. I like certain things in a certain way. It can be comfort. You know, it does not require a lot of me to live within my walls 
It's a place of ease, safety. If I create a wall and put you on the other side, I don't need to be afraid that you may hurt me. You know, prejudice, you know, casting these big, you know, statements about another group because they're different in some way. You know, you want to look at a, an example of this. Sometimes you go through a town and you see there's First Baptist Church and then there's Second Baptist Church. Now, many times Second Baptist Church is because, well, it was started after the First Baptist Church, okay? So in many places that's true. But there's also places where the Second Baptist Church that was seeking to declare the gospel had to be started because the people in the Second Baptist Church weren't welcome in the First Baptist Church because of skin color. And so that's why sometimes, for some churches, a Second Baptist Church has its origin in prejudice or being the victims of prejudice. The walls that we can create and we can fracture along lines of political ideology, urban, rural, rich, poor, male, female, or even the church that we attend. And that's why the theme of unity and the pursuit of unity is repeated over and over and over again. You know, if you go to John chapter 17, and you look at, we read, if you go through the Gospels, you see that Jesus prayed any number of times, right? He was always going off to pray, such that the disciples said, Lord, we want to learn how to pray like you're praying, because you do it a lot, so it must be important. But in John 17, we see recorded one of Jesus' prayers in depth, and at the core of that prayer is this, Lord, may they be one. Jesus prayed that we would be one people, that is, citizens of God's kingdom, together. Saints in service to our God, together. Uh, daughters and sons in God's family, together. And what we see here, like in that verse 22, in him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit, that when the walls come down, God's Spirit moves across his people. And he works in and through his people. Because we are citizens of his kingdom. We are saints in his service. And we're members of his family. Hey, I'm going to invite the band to come on up now. And, and <clears throat> as they're coming up, you know, there's, there's a lot here that I would invite you to, at some point, just park on and, and, and just read through it. Uh, during the course of this week, just read through it and just say, okay, what's this, what's this saying to me? What's this saying to my engagement in, in the with the body of Community Church New City. What is this saying? Because, you know, it's easy to feel rather localized when we're together like this. But think of it this way. When we gather together in worship, it's not just us alone. We are joining together with those who are gathered around the throne even now declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We are gathering around the throne, even though physically we're not present, with brothers and sisters uh, across, across this town, ac across this state, across this region, across this globe. Uh, in our case of community church, we're one church in multiple locations with a desire to follow Jesus together and being a community of faith that brings faith to the community such that, yeah, there's Community Church New City. There's Community Church Riff Road. There's Community Church Winter Haven, Florida. That always sounds very appealing in January and February. But we are all connected around that desire to serve our Lord as one. And so 
you know, as I got thinking about it, I want to challenge you to look for those opportunities to impact our community through the declaration of the gospel in, in word and, and in action. And to actually, yes, do things, but to describe and tell people why we're doing it. That, that as his people, we feel it call, our call to share the love of Christ and what he has done. Oh, I picked up on the back table here this invitation to rock the block, a, a neighborhood renovation. It's a great opportunity to get out in the community and, yeah, literally get our hands dirty. And when people say, well, why are you doing this? Well, we're doing it because we care about people. People who are creating the image of God. People who need to know that they're creating the image of God. People who need to hear what God has done on behalf of those who are created in his image. Oh, second, to, you know, celebrating what God is doing and striving to know what God is doing through us together. Yeah, you know, we have that site down in Florida, Community Church Winter Haven. It's a seasonal site because a retired couple that was going down to Winter Haven said, hey, we want to start a church here. So they started one. This is awesome. We got a missions team coming back from Appalachia today been working and serving the people of Appalachia. Middle school kids and adult volunteers. That's awesome. And we can celebrate that and pray uh, that God would take that seed that has been uh, set in that soil and that they, people would respond. Oh, something else we could be doing is as we're going about through the week, yes, praying, praying for one another in this body, but also praying as we pass by a church where we know that the gospel of Jesus is proclaimed. And not just look at him and at the building and say, oh, that's a nice building. They must have done a new paint job. But say, Lord, those people are able to reach people that we can't reach, so bless their efforts. May they remember that they are fellow citizens, they're fellow saints, they're brothers and sisters. Oh, Lord, may it be so. And pray for them. Oh, Paul declares that our awesome God is at work, creating in his people, in us, a work in progress. But even now, a beautiful masterpiece as it is. So, I challenge you, read Ephesians chapter 2. Let your mind and heart park on it. Think about ways that you can be actively involved here because if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are that fellow citizen. You are that fellow saint. You are that brother or that sister in God's family, and we need you to be involved. We need you to be praying. We need you to be listening for what God is calling you to do and do it. It's a privilege also as an expression of worship to say thank you, God, in the giving of our gifts and offerings. And in just a moment, our, we're going to take the offering here. And I would pray that you would view it as an opportunity to say thank you to God for the blessings that he's bestowed upon you, that he's given to you. An opportunity to share in what God is doing here and literally across the globe. But as, uh, as our connectors come forward, let's pray and give this to him. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have this ability to worship you in this way. We pray that you would take our gifts and our offerings and may they be symbolic of our, our very lives. That we would be giving up to you out of what you've blessed us with to see your kingdom advanced and more come to know Jesus who is the cornerstone of our faith upon whom with his name and, and his work in our lives through the spirit we are here 
this morning. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us in our podcast today. Uh, if you are looking for ways to partner with us here at Community Church, you can check out our website at community-church.com.